So thank you for being here. Uh, this is the last of these whole brain seminars for PhD students of the quarter. Um, the ones that are planned um, starting April 17 will be Ken Older from History, uh, Historian of Science. By the way, there is a course that has been advertised by Ken that looks extremely good. I, un I would encourage you to, to take a look at that. Then Sherry Diamond, who is from the Law School and Psychology. And then Tom Rosenthal, who works on set design. He's one of these guys who has won Tony Awards. And designing sets is a very creative activity and something that you don't hear often. But the whole point of these seminars, as we have said in the past, um, I'm doing this with Linda Broadbelt, who is sitting over there, is to broaden your horizon. So today we're going to have Sandy Goldberg. Um, you all have, will have the title of Doctor of Philosophy, but he's a real Doctor of Philosophy. <laughs> <coughs> uh, he's undergraduate degrees from Rutgers, that as Iowa with writing, Iowa in writing is one of the top programs. Rutgers in philosophy is a powerhouse. And a PhD from Columbia. He works on many other things on epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. How do we know what we know kind of things. I'm going to let him explain that. And this is an unusual talk in the sense that Almost never you will hear a philosopher giving a talk using slides, but you're in a special group, so he has prepared slides. And I don't know if you know, no one in this group will ever give a talk without using PowerPoints now, okay? That's the way that in science works, but if you're in mathematics, if you are math and give a talk with PowerPoints, you'll be laughed out of the room, okay? Just be bored. And in humanities, you write the talk and you almost read it. And at the other extreme, if you are an art historian, and this was way before PowerPoint, you will always use two screens. Okay, so this is different, and I'm highly appreciative of Sandy for taking the time to put some slides together. And as I said, the whole point of these talks is to broaden your thinking space. So with that being said, I'll give you Sandy Goldberg. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Julio. Um, so Dino Tino is correct. In philosophy, we don't often use slides. I use slides only when I am presenting to an audience of non-philosophers. If this were a philosophy talk, I probably would just, I would not use a paper that I would read. I would talk it, but I would have handouts of arguments. But this is not that. So, so uh, fear not, there will be no handouts of arguments today. I am going to talk to you today about what we can learn from disagreement. Um, and that topic should strike you as somewhat unusual uh, in the sense that disagreement is something that happens all the time. It even happens at the cutting edge of science, maybe even in uh, aspects of science that are not cutting edge. But you might wonder why we can actually have a question uh, where we would expect an interesting answer, a question like what can we learn from disagreement. So here's what I plan to do for, for today. I'm going to give you a little bit of history. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call forgive the language, the epistemological ideology of the Enlightenment. I will tell you what that means. That's a mouthful. I will tell you what that means. Uh, I'm going to then go into some recent discussions, that is discussions that I myself and some of my colleagues here in the philosophy department participate in about the nature of disagreement. And then finally, uh, I'm going to conclude very briefly with uh, an attempt to give you a sense of why disagreement might be the sort of thing from which we can learn interesting things, things beyond the kinds of things you might have thought we can learn from disagreement. So let's start with the, the, what I call the epistemological ideology of the Enlightenment. Start with the Enlightenment, some basic facts. Many of you will know these facts. I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. The reason that I do this is because I want all of you to have a sense of where, at least in the Western tradition, many of our fundamental assumptions about disagreement come from, including assumptions, some of which that I will want to call into question today. <clears throat> 
So here are the basic facts of the Enlightenment. We're talking typically 17th and 18th century, early modern Europe. So I'm talking about a, an early, a Western phenomenon. There were other things that were going on in the East at the time. And the significance for us is that we have a changing intellectual set of practices and norms. That's going to be what's important for me. Uh, we see changing intellectual practices and norms in empirical inquiry. So those of you who know your history well will know that starting roughly in the 16th century, maybe even in the 15th century, you have the beginning of what we in philosophy used to call natural philosophy, but which over here at McCormick is called science. Science, as you all know, did begin in its infancy in the philosophy departments. Um, it's also during this period of 17th and 18th century Europe when we have the emergence of an interest in, in the human sciences, um, if you like what we now call the social sciences. And we also have changing intellectual practices and norms in, uh, in philosophy as well, and I'm going to get to those in a moment. Just to bring you up to speed, who are the figures that we're talking about? Some of these will be very familiar to you. Some of these will not be familiar to you, but the figures we're talking about, Francis Bacon, one of the very early experimentalists, one of the very early people to focus on induction as a way to acquire knowledge. Big in philosophy, Rene Descartes from France. Uh, another important philosopher, Baruch Spinoza, originally from Portugal by way of Amsterdam when he fled Portugal, when his, or when his family fled, fled Portugal. John Locke, English philosopher of the, of the 17th century. David Hume, one of my all-time favorites, not merely because he's from that lovely city of Edinburgh, Scotland, but because he was one of the really great skeptics of his day, pointing out what we can learn from skepticism. Uh, Denise Diderot from France, uh, those many of you will know him as the, the first person to initiate the idea of an encyclopedia, collecting all of the knowledge that we had in a single place. That idea is impossible these days. But in the 18th century, in early 18th century France, that idea was an idea that Diderot had. You have the famous German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who wrote a very influential piece in the late uh, 18th century entitled, What is Enlightenment? And you have, of course, Adam Smith, one of the colleagues of David Hume in that lovely city of Edinburgh, the, um, also considered himself a philosopher. Of course, we now regard him as the father of economics. He wrote the very influential Wealth of Nations. I also want to point out not just intellectuals who actually contributed to the Enlightenment, but my sense is that you don't really have a sense of the Enlightenment until you see the political figures that actually embraced the Enlightenment and Enlightenment ideals and supported it with, both with money and with their support and with their political prestige. The person that I think is most important here is Catherine of Russia, otherwise known as Catherine the Great. Um, she herself was extremely influential in the spread of uh, Enlightenment ideas in Western Europe. And of course, she was influential also, for those of you who know the history of Russia, very influential in initiating um, the, what they call the Golden Age of Russia. OK, that's the background. What is the ideology that I want to talk to you about? So I want to first define my terms a little bit. What is epistemology? Dino Tino put it to you best. It's the theory of knowledge. We ask things like, what are the sources of knowledge? Under what conditions do we count as knowing something as opposed to merely believing it? What exactly is evidence? And how does evidence support theory? These are the kinds of questions that we ask in epistemology. What do I mean by ideology? Here I'm going to characterize it as a system of norms and doctrines that serve as the foundation of economic, social, political, or today's, today's talk, intellectual policy. Please be aware that when I use the term ideology, I do not use that as a negative term. I don't mean to be saying it's a bad thing. Ideology can be bad. It can also be good. Um, arguably, what we call the scientific method is an ideology, an intellectual ideology, behind the kind of work that goes on in McCormick and in, in departments in, in Weinberg as well, physics, chemistry, and so forth. So by ideology, all I mean, I mean a neutral word to describe a system of norms and doctrines that serve as the foundation of today, Today we're going to talk about intellectual policy. So what was the Enlightenment ideology? What was its epistemic ideology? Um, many of you will know that they highlighted what they called the authority of reason. And there was an insistence on individuals' ability to reason for themselves. This is going to be extremely important. For those of you who know the history of Western philosophy, you'll know that this is a point that Descartes made. It was a point that John Locke made. Many people made this point. They often made it in two connections not just with respect to intellectual matters, but also with respect to political matters. And we'll come back to that in a moment. The ideology of the Enlightenment was also, um, uh, it also involved a rejection of socially sanctioned forms of authority, whether these be religious or political authority. 
So this is a period in which there's all sort of tumult in the intellectual lives of the people of Western Europe at the time. I'm going to point to several fruits of this, of, the, of, of Enlightenment ideology. Some of this will be very familiar to you. So for example, 16th, 17th, and 18th century Europe, we see the rise of more democratic forms of governance. We also see the rise of market capitalism, and we see the rise and emerging domination of science as the most trusted form of human inquiry. This is something I'm going to want to talk about at greater length, because this is something that I think is really interesting. It carries with it an entire ideology, and I'm going to want to try to unpack it a little bit. I'm also going to talk about the dominance of individualism as a, as a doctrine. So individualism in politics and political philosophy, whereas Plato might have said to you that the state takes priority over the individual, individuals live to serve the state. In the 17th and 18th century in Europe, that gets reversed. The state now exists and is justified only in terms of what it can do for individuals. We see the dominance of individualism in the rise of economics as a discipline. So one of the things that Adam Smith taught us is how to regard individual people as quote unquote rational agents in the marketplace. And he developed an entire theory that was a theory of how rational individuals in the marketplace interact with one another, the result of which is what we now call uh, the dismal science of economics. Um, and then finally, the dominance of individualism in intellectual life more generally. This is a period of really, really wonderful, I call it wonderful skepticism uh, of, of doubting, doubting traditional authorities, doubting tradition. It's a, a period rife with, with um, intellectual ferment, if we can put it that way. All right, this gets to what I want to focus on today, which are some of the key assumptions of Enlightenment ideology. And I want to remind you the reason that I'm taking you through this tour of history. It's not merely because I happen to like history, which I do. It's because I want to give you the background of assumptions that I suspect inform some, perhaps many, and maybe even all of our thinking about disagreement. So here are some key assumptions, uh, key assumptions of Enlightenment ideology. First, over time, inquirers ought to converge on the truth. It's not going to happen that over time our belief systems are going to become more and more divergent they should become more and more convergent on the truth. Very important assumption they're making. If you ask, what is the mechanism of this convergence? The answer they would give you is that it's not just evidence. It's not just their focus on evidence. Arguably, I think people focused on evidence from time immemorial. What the Enlightenment focused on was publicly available evidence. Evidence which is such that if I have it, I can offer it to you. It's not private to me. It's not that I've been spoken to by God. It's that I can cite evidence that in principle should be available to you. And once there is an increase in that kind of evidence, we are also going to assume that that evidence can be assessed by any competent human being whatsoever. We are not going to buy into old views as to the importance of an intellectual elite who will tell us what to think. Any one of us in principle can assess that public evidence and in principle come to the same conclusions from it. Big important difference, a big, another assumption, there are no individual differences regarding the competent assessment of the evidence. What that means is that, and this is the key claim I'm going to bring with me for the rest of the lecture, any disagreement about the significance of evidence indicates that at least one party is wrong. If you and I disagree, if we share all of our evidence and we disagree about what that evidence shows, that must tell us that at least one of us is wrong. Maybe both of us are wrong but at least one of us is wrong. This comes directly out of Enlightenment ideology, and I'm going, to call, I'm going to call it the key Enlightenment assumption. The assumption is that any disagreement about the evidence, about the significance of the evidence, not what evidence we have, but what significance it has, once you've agreed on what evidence you have, any disagreement about its significance indicates that at least one of the disputing parties must be wrong. I think this is a view that many of us continue to have. It's an interesting view, and I, there are philosophers who continue to defend it to this day. What I want to do now and what follows is I want to try to give you a sense of how in the hands of contemporary philosophers we turn this enlightenment assumption into claims that are a little bit clearer. This claim isn't quite as clear as I would like it to be. Uh, what, what we do these days is we try to translate that claim into something that's a little bit clearer. So here we go. I'm going to give you several attempts. Hopefully some of these will seem interesting to you. Several attempts to make this, this assumption precise. And I'm going, to, I'm going to label these attempts, attempts that try to characterize a doctrine that I'm going to call uniqueness. 
You'll see why I call it uniqueness in a moment. But the idea is to try to render this key enlightenment assumption more precise. So here's version number one. Take any body of evidence E. Forgive me for, for, using the, uh, for using E. That just means put any body of evidence you want in there. For any evidence E and any hypothesis H, there's exactly one rational attitude to have towards H. So take any body of evidence, take any hypothesis you want, there's exactly one rational attitude to have towards, towards the hypothesis. This says that there is a uniquely rational attitude to have. You either should believe the hypothesis, you should disbelieve the hypothesis, or you should be agnostic. It's never the case that there's more than one attitude that's rational, given, given a single body of evidence. That's one way to spell out the assumption. Here's a second way to spell out the assumption. For any evidence E in hypothesis H, there's exactly one rational credence to assign to H. Those of you who've had economics uh, or, or who've had probability theory, you may have heard of this term rational credence or credence before. A credence is just the probability you assign to a proposition's being true. So if you think it's, if there's a 50-50 chance of snow tonight, the rational credence for snow would be 0.5. It's just, rational credence is a way of measuring the credence that the evidence supports for a given hypothesis. If you take the, the model of credences, this is a model that people uh, endorse when they think, we shouldn't think in terms of beliefs, disbeliefs, or agnosticism. We should have a more fine-grained way of representing the human mind's attitude towards a given proposition. We should talk in terms of credences. If that's the model you like, the doctrine of uniqueness is going to come to this. For any evidence E in hypothesis H, there's exactly one rational credence to have towards H. If you have anything other than that, you are not, rationally, you are not rational in the credence you assign. I call this uniqueness regarding rational credence. Here's a third version. For any evidence E and set of mutually incompatible theories T1 through Tn, there is at least, sorry, at most, one theory that is acceptable. I think this one is an interesting one. When I, on those occasions when I teach philosophy of science, this is the version of uniqueness that I use. What uniqueness says about scientific context is that at most, one of the theories that is the theories you're considering, they should be mutually inconsistent. At most, one of them is acceptable. No body of evidence can support more than one mutually inconsistent theory. That's the idea. So if somebody who endorses T1 is, is right, then somebody who endorses T2 must be wrong. That's not the theory to endorse on the basis of the evidence. I call this uniqueness regarding acceptable theories. Now I'm going to um, give you version four, two versions of, uh, sorry, two kinds of version four. I'm going to assume that at least some of you are computer scientists. These versions, 4.1 and 4.2, are designed for you. Here's 4.1. There is an algorithm A such that given evidence E and hypothesis A, H, A would yield whether H is to be believed and what credence to assign to H. This one strikes me as interesting. Because what this says is that we should be able to design an algorithm that takes as its input a representation of all of the evidence that there is and yields as an output either whether this hypothesis should be believed, disbelieved, or we should remain agnostic, or it can determine what precise credence we ought to have in the, in the truth of that hypothesis. This is a, what I call a computational implementation of versions 1 and 2. Here's version 4.2. There's an algorithm such that given evidence E in a set of mutually incompatible theories, A would yield which one, if any, of these is acceptable. I mentioned these two to you very briefly because there are philosophers who have a, a background, often PhDs in computer science as well, who try to actually come up with algorithms that yield these results. The very move to do so, I think, commits them to an assumption, namely the assumption of the, 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 what I call the key enlightenment assumption. I highlight that that assumption does not have to be true. Maybe it's true, maybe it's false. It is an assumption. And these are ways of trying to implement that assumption in, computer, in, in computational settings. OK. Here's a key implication of the doctrine of uniqueness. If two parties share all their evidence, and they're equally competent in assessing that evidence, they must reach the same conclusion. What this means is that, I like to highlight this to my, to my family, because we always, in my family, we always agree to disagree. If uniqueness is true, the policy of agreeing to disagree can never be rational. That is, it can never rem rem render both parties rational under these conditions. That is, it can't render two parties rational when they disagree on the assumption that they share all of their evidence. 
if you share all of your evidence and you disagree, then at least one of you must be wrong. Then at least one of you must be making a mistake or doing something incorrect with respect to your evidence. Under ideal conditions, so this, uh, this, this doctrine implies, rational disagreement about a single body of evidence is not possible. Under these conditions, disagreement is always evidence of irrationality, incompetence, or error. These, I hope you agree, are extremely strong claims. They are very strong claims. In particular, I'm going to focus on the scientific context, but it doesn't take a lot of thinking to recognize how strong these claims are in the political context. You can imagine in the political context, it's like, okay, we have somebody on the left and somebody on the right, and we share all of our, our evidence. If we're disagreeing after having shared all of our evidence, then at least one of us must be wrong. That's what this seems to imply. That's what this does imply. That's what this does imply. I'm interested, I'll get to the political context only towards the end. I'm interested more in the scientific context, where I think even though these, these assumptions are, 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 these implications are strong, I think some of us still actually believe them. I'm interested in the scientific context because it's there that you can give these assumptions their run for the money. Okay. I made a comment that I hope strikes some of you as strange. I, maybe I made many comments that strikes some of you as strange. This is the comment that I made that should strike you as strange. Disagreement is evidence for dot, dot, dot. In what sense is disagreement evidence? In what sense is this? If you were trying to write a paper, suppose you wanted to get a paper published in an engineering journal or a physics journal, and you were trying to um, defend an hypothesis on the basis of your evidence, it would be strange indeed for you to cite the fact that there you disagree with someone as evidence. That's not the kind of evidence typically used in, in, in science. So in what sense do, can I talk about disagreement as providing evidence? Here's what I have in mind. Let me start just with the notion of evidence. You all know what evidence is. You know it when you see it. In philosophy, we don't just see it, we try to define it. So here's going to be my, my, best, my best characterization, at least to first attempt, at what evidence is. Evidence, I'm going to say, is any consideration that counts in favor of, that is, that indicates or raises the probability of the truth of a given proposition or hypothesis. That's what I'm going to take evidence to be. Any consideration that meets that definition is going to count for me as evidence. Now I'm going to make a distinction. This distinction may not be familiar to everyone, so I'm going to make it somewhat slowly. I'm going to distinguish first order evidence and higher order evidence. And this is a very rough first approximation. So if I have, if some of you are already familiar with this distinction, you're, you're going to see that my characterizations are loose. They're good enough for today, but they're not, they're not perfect. Suppose you're interested in some hypothesis. You have an hypothesis and you want to test it. I'm going to say that evidence that confirms or disconfirms that hypothesis is first order evidence. Sometimes we get evidence pertaining not to the truth of the hypothesis we're interested in, but rather to the existence or the character of the evidence pertaining to the truth of the hypothesis. I'm going to call that evidence that pertains to the existence or character of evidence. I'm going to call that higher order evidence. The lesson of today is going to be how should we handle the higher order evidence that we get when we do inquiry, when we perform inquiry. I'm going to call that higher order evidence. So just simple examples. New tracks in the snow. First order evidence of the recent presence of some animal. Pretty straightforward. We go walking, we see the tracks. Ah, some, some deer, if I'm really good at distinguishing deer tracks, there must have been a deer here in the last 48 hours. But consider a note left by the thieves telling us that our next clue as to the whereabouts of the diamonds is in room 238. That's evidence. That is evidence. It's evidence of the existence of evidence. I'm going to call that higher order evidence. That's, a, that's not such an interesting example of higher order evidence, but in our intellectual lives, in your intellectual lives as scientists, you get higher order evidence all the time. And one of the things that I do as a philosopher, especially training my PhD students, is I try to give them a sense of how to handle higher order evidence. Because a lot of the action that makes me most excited as, an, as somebody who is devoted to the intellectual life is higher order evidence. The first order evidence is interesting. Higher order evidence is actually interesting and often tricky to handle. So as I said to you before, in most scientific work, in most scientific work, what you really care about is first order evidence. In fact, first order evidence is standardly the only evidence that matters. I say in most scientific work, not in all scientific work. If I have anyone who knows any cognitive psychology, you'll know that in some psychology, 
uh, in, in, in some psychology domains, higher order evidence actually is very, very interesting because it tells us something about the nature of human cognition. And I say that in most scientific work, first order evidence is standardly the only evidence that matters. But sometimes even in the sciences, higher order evidence matters. Even in the sciences, higher order evidence can be published. Sometimes in the sciences, higher order evidence is extremely significant. I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room knows what I'm about to talk about. Review articles, meta-analyses, taking a look at the last 20 years of, of data and, and, and theory, theory construction on the basis of the data, comparing the different theories. These all involve higher order evidence. These all involve, what we're looking at is working at theories that are constructed on the basis of the evidence. And we want to know what does that tell us about the nature of the evidence itself. So we're looking at higher order evidence. What I want to suggest is that in the process of scientific inquiry itself, and I think this is true of inquiry more generally, higher order evidence can be extremely important. And in fact, that's what disagreement is all about. Contemporary philosophical discussions of disagreement focus on its significance as higher order evidence. When you disagree with someone, when you disagree with someone, that gives you some evidence about the evidential situation facing you and your disagreeing partner. And that's the kind of thing that we can begin to learn from when we focus on disagreements. Let me see if I can spell this out a little bit more clearly. In my world um, of academic philosophy, when we focus on, on disagreements and we want to learn, we want to think about disagreements and their significance and what we should learn from them, we tend to focus on two, two questions. The status of the doctrine of uniqueness itself, the doctrine that I presented to you earlier, and in addition, the significance of higher order evidence in belief formation and theory selection. Those are the two things that we focus on. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each before I draw some, some quick conclusions. Let's go to the status of uniqueness itself. Remember what uniqueness tells you roughly. Uniqueness tells you this. Given any body of evidence that you like, that body of evidence will determine, for any hypothesis you think of, a uniquely rational attitude to have towards that hypothesis. That's what uniqueness says. For any body of evidence and any hypothesis, that body of evidence determines a uniquely rational attitude to have or uniquely rational credence to have towards that hypothesis. Suppose uniqueness is false. Suppose uniqueness is false. What that means is that there can be more than one rational way to respond to the same body of evidence. Notice, if that's true, then the fact that you disagree with someone, even if that person is competent about how to respond to your evidence, that doesn't by itself show that at least one of you must be wrong. If uniqueness is false, it looks like the key enlightenment assumption must be false. If uniqueness is false, the key uh, enlightenment assumption must be false. That's not entirely surprising. Because as I said to you, uniqueness was a way of trying to capture the key enlightenment assumption. What I'm pointing out now is that in uniqueness gives us a way to see whether we can figure out whether that assumption is true or false. We can look at uniqueness and try to determine whether, whether we should accept that. What are the kinds of things that might lead you to doubt uniqueness? What are the kinds of things that might lead you to wonder or to, or to suppose that there's more than one rational uh, attitude to have to a hypothesis, even given a single body of evidence? Why might you think that's true? Why might you think that the evidence alone doesn't force you into, rationally force you into uh, the proper attitude towards an hypothesis? I'm going to cite three different kinds of consideration that philosophers have talked about in this connection. I want to say at the outset, two of these are purely intellectual. They have nothing to do with the practical world. The third has to do with the practical world. That's when we're going to get into politics. But even before we get into politics, this is the point that I want to make, even before we get into politics, sticking purely in, in the intellectual world alone, there are at least two kinds of consideration that have led some philosophers to question the doctrine I'm calling uniqueness. First. Legitimate variation in risk toleration. Here I need to jump from the 16th, uh, 17th, and 18th century into the early 20th century. And I need to go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where there was a very famous, I'm going to call him a philosopher, other people will call him a psychologist, at Harvard University by the name of William James. What I'm about to tell you is, one of, in my opinion, one of William James' great insights. He, I'm going to call it epistemic risk. 
epistemic risk. I'm going to tell you what I mean by it right now. When you inquire, when you want to find things out, you actually have two distinct goals. And it's important to recognize that you have two goals, not one, two. One of your goals is to acquire beliefs that are true. You can substitute theories if you like. I talk about beliefs. If you want to talk about theories, that's fine with me. That's one of your goals. But don't forget that there's another goal. And this is James' great insight to remind us of this. Avoid acquiring beliefs that are false. If you want to switch beliefs for theories, that's fine with me. I don't care. James says, or said, the history of philosophy is rife with people who only focused on one of those two things, namely acquiring true beliefs. But they forgot that when you are in the business of inquiring, you want to acquire true beliefs, but you also want to, acquire, you want to avoid false beliefs. And the proof of that is that if, if all you cared about was true beliefs, then you should believe everything you ever encounter. That will ensure that you get all the truths. Oh, but it'll also mean you get a lot of falsehoods, too. So James says, when you are inquiring, there's a trade-off between the, the hope of acquiring true beliefs and the avoiding of false beliefs. So different policies about the risks that you're willing to take with respect to truth and falsity arise over how much risk we're willing to take in our attempt to acquire beliefs that are true or false. So for example, I made these two policies up, but you, you, you're going to have a sense of what, of, of what I'm talking about. The policy number one I call fear of missing out. You've all heard of FOMO or fear of missing out. Turns out that name's an intellectual policy as well. That name, you didn't realize it, but that name's, a, uh, that name's an, uh, an intellectual policy. The fear of missing out essentially is the policy that favors acquiring truth over avoiding falsehood. I really fear missing out on a truth that I want to get. Because I want to get these truths so much, I'm willing to tolerate a little bit of risk with respect to getting falsehoods because I want to get at the truth. If that's the policy you favor, then you're going to tolerate higher degrees of risk, the risk of accepting false hypotheses in order to acquire true ones. Of course, the, the limit case of this, as I told you, is accept all hypotheses. That's not a good version of the fear of missing out. That's, that version is going to ensure that you're going to get a lot of false beliefs or false theories too. But that is a way of, of implementing the fear of missing out. Second policy, the fear of being duped. The fear of being duped. Turns out, in the history of philosophy, according to William James, this was the policy that most people followed. So it's a policy that says you should favor avoiding falsity over acquiring truths. For those of you who know Descartes, this is the Cartesian approach to knowledge. If you follow that, you're only going to tolerate lower degrees of risk. So it's no surprise that we find Rene Descartes in the meditations saying you shouldn't believe anything except those things for which you can be absolutely certain of their truth. Why? Because he had a fear of being duped. He was willing to give up on the prospect of certain truths in order to ensure against error. That's fine, but that was a policy decision, says William James. And I think James was right about that. Of course, the limit, if you have the fear of being duped, is to accept nothing. And it's interesting to note, again, here I'm following James, you can think of the skeptic as one who has a, an especially acute case of the fear of being duped. That's what the skeptic is. She's someone who says, you know what, I'm so worried about believing something false that I'm, I'd rather not believe anything at all than to risk believing something false. OK, that's a policy, a policy decision you can make. Here's a point. If there is no uniquely rational degree of risk toleration, then there is no uniquely rational policy. If there's no uniquely rational policy, then two people who accept different acceptable policies can disagree about what the evidence warrants without thereby being convicted of incompetence or error or irrationality. This is William James' argument against uniqueness. It says, look, in our intellectual lives, don't think that we're only pursuing one goal. We're pursuing two goals. And by the way, it's up to us how much risk we want to tolerate. There should be variation in the intellectual marketplace. Some people are going to err on the side of wanting to get as many truths as they can. They're going to take high risks with respect to falsehood. Other people are going to want to avoid falsehood at all costs. So they're going to, they're going to risk losing out on truths in order not to be duped. Let a thousand flowers bloom in the marketplace of ideas. There is no single rational policy to follow. And if that's correct, uniqueness is false. So says William James. Here's another argument against uniqueness. Here's another argument against uniqueness. 
This one may be more familiar to all of you here because it has to do with values, intellectual values and theory selection and the trade-offs that are involved. Since I assume this is going to be somewhat more familiar to all of you, I will tr I'll go through this one a little bit more quickly. When you're trying to choose theories, you're, you're doing science, you're trying to, to choose theories or, or hypotheses, turns out there are a number of values that, that you can care about. So these are going to be values that, that you're already familiar with. You can care about the simplicity of a theory. Given two theories, most people prefer the, and you should, I think, prefer the simpler theory over the more complicated theory if they're otherwise equally acceptable. We have explanatory and predictive power. Some people really, really like a theory that has great explanatory and predictive power. You might get into trouble when you ask yourself, what happens if you have one theory that's simple, but it has less predictive power than another theory that's not quite as simple? How do you trade off simplicity for predictive power, explanatory power? Then we can even make this more complicated. What about the power to provide theoretical unification? Some people in the philosophy of science think that this, think that this is the virtue of, of scientific theories. Given any two theories, you should always prefer this, a theory that greater unifies all, all sorts of theories in, in, in domains than, than a theory that doesn't unify. But you can ask how much of that theoretical unification would, uh, would enable you to, to, um, to accept a much more complicated theory, to give up on simplicity? Or how much of that theoretical unification do you need before you give up on perhaps predictive power if they, if they come into conflict? The point here is that there are lots of different values in theory selection, and there may be different trade-offs. And I'm now going to add one that I, I think is not even, is not even uh, purely intellectual, but I wanted to put it up there anyway. That's technological applications. Some people prefer theories that have great technolo te technological applications, even if they're not that simple, even if they're not that explanatory. Why? Well, technological applications are great, and they can make you a lot of money, and they can improve the state of humanity. So that's really what we should care about much more so than these other things. Let the, th the fancy theorists, the so-called ivory tower folks, care about simplicity. What we care about is actually improving the world. And to improve the world, what we really want are technological applications. Again, when these things collide, how do you choose which one is the one that gives you the correct theory of, uh, that you're looking for? The point that I want to make there is just that um, it looks like, sorry, before I get there, the point that I want to make with respect to those is that it looks like if you just look at these, if there is no single rational way to pr pr provide for a hierarchy of these theories and, and rank them according to importance, then it looks like you're, gonna get, you're gonna, going to get into the same problem we had before. Two people facing the same evidence might arrive at different conclusions as to which theory to endorse. Why? Because they adopt different policies as to which one of these are more important. Once again, if that's correct, uniqueness is false. So once again, we have an argument for the falsity of uniqueness. Third, we're leaving the intellectual realm altogether now. We're going to the practical realm. Again, there might be legitimate variation in rational trade-offs and practical values. So for example, um, uh, you, you, might have, you might have theories that can differ according to the kinds of things that they can do, the kind of practical risks that they would enable us to, that they force us to run into. So I'm going to summarize this by saying that whereas the previous two considerations uh, pertain to variation and toleration for epistemic risks and trade-offs, um, now we're going to practical types of risk and trade-offs. The claim, once again, is that if there is no uniquely rational position to take on these trade-offs, they too call uniqueness into question. And here, I think this is going to be familiar to all of you, especially those of you that care about public policy. When you get here, you are thick in the middle of politics. How do we trade off, for example, considerations of public safety, cost, effects on the environment, the prospect for future applications emerging out of current research. These, how we trade these off looks like a purely political matter. But notice, if you think that there's no single way, single right way to, to figure out how to trade these things off, if people can actually have disagreements about these and not be irrational, then it looks like you can choose which, which research program to follow on the basis of these kinds of considerations and two, diff two people can arrive at very different conclusions giving the same evidence. So once again, here's a practical argument against uniqueness. Not a purely intellectual argument, but a practical argument against uniqueness. So, so far we looked at uniqueness itself. That's not the only thing that philosophers will look at, and I want to see if we can finish this up pretty, pretty quickly. So I'm going to go through, this, uh, go through this section somewhat quickly. Philosophers also look at the significance of higher order evidence itself. 
point here is a rather straightforward one. Even if uniqueness is true, that doesn't yet tell you what the epistemic significance of disagreement is. All that it tells you is that for any body of evidence, there's one unique, unique, uniquely rational uh, position to have. Um, the epistemic significance of disagreement turns on the epistemic significance of disagreement as a higher order kind of evidence. So if that evidence is epistemically significant, disagreement is epistemically significant. If not, not. Very quickly, two competing visions here. Uh, I'm not going to have as much time as I had hoped to talk to you about these visions. But there are two broad approaches to this. One of them, uh, the, the term that we use in philosophy is non-conciliationism. It says that the higher order evidence provided by disagreement ought to be of no significance whatsoever to what one believes and accepts. I'll come back to that. Against that, we have the conciliationist view, which says higher order evidence provided by disagreement is significant and should affect what you believe and accept, at least to some degree. Why would you, think, why would you believe in non-conciliationism? Why would you think that the higher order evidence that you get, the fact that we disagree should be of no significance whatsoever to what you believe. Why should you think that? Here are several reasons. Treating the disagreement itself as significant, that is in terms of what you ought to believe or accept, leads to intellectual spinelessness. You should let the evidence tell you what to believe. The fact that you disagree is irrelevant. The evidence alone, the first order evidence alone, should tell you what to, what to believe. Treating disagreement as significance is self-defeating. Philosophers disagree about the significance of disagreement. So if every time there's a disagreement, you should, as it were, change your mind, it look, looks like you're going to get into a self-defeating kind of situation. Here's another reason you might want to buy non-conciliationism. Suppose you and an equally competent person have shared all of your evidence with one another, and you still disagree. Then the fact of disagreement neither provides nor points to new first order evidence, and that's ultimately the only thing that really matters. So the fact of disagreement seems irrelevant. And if you correctly interpreted your evidence, then the mere fact that your peer disagrees with you should not move you at all. If you didn't properly interpret your evidence, then that fact and not the fact of disagreement is the problem. In no case is the fact of disagreement significant. That looks like we should all be non-conciliationists. We should think that disagreement is, has no significance. Why would you think otherwise? Well, wait a second. Wait a second. Non-conciliationism is a recipe for dogmatism. That's a recipe that says, I've looked at my evidence. I've come to the conclusion, every time you disagree with me, I don't care. I'm sticking to my guns. That's a kind of dogmatism. Why is that a bad thing? Well, disagreement, I think, can sometimes give us higher order evidence that we may have made a mistake in response to our first order evidence. It's an opportunity for self-correction. In light of this, many people think that the evidence that you get when you disagree with someone ought to lead you to, to decrease the confidence that you have in your conclusion and recheck your evidence again, and so on and so forth. Concluding section. What can we learn from disagreement? And I apologize that I'm, I'm going just a little bit over. Disagreement is higher order evidence. If I've convinced you of nothing else today, let that be the one lesson that you take home. Because what I want to suggest is that as higher, or, as higher order evidence, it can be evidence of a number of things. And you can learn these things from the fact that you disagreed. It can be evidence that there's additional evidence that one oneself lacks. I get into a disagreement with my daughter, who's in medical school. I think that I have such and such a condition, given, given the evidence that I have. She has the same evidence. She says to me, Dad, you're wrong. I'm sorry. That's not what you have. You have another condition. I ought to take the fact that we disagree to give evidence to me that she's got more evidence than I have. Disagreement can also be evidence that your, your interlocutor has greater competence in, the, in assessing the shared public evidence. If I get into a disagreement with a colleague in the computer science department, even though I took my fair share of computer science, suppose I actually know all of the facts that there are in, in how to set up a, a, uh, an algorithm and what, what to predict. If I disagree with my computer science colleague on a matter of computer science, even if I have all the evidence, I'm going to say, wait a second, she's a computer scientist. She's got more competence than I do in assessing the evidence. I might have made a mistake in assessing my own evidence. Disagreement can be evidence that you made a mistake. Often we find that we, in fact, in philosophy papers, the reason I give my papers to my smarter colleagues is because if they disagree with me, that gives me evidence that I made a mistake in my reasoning. And that's really important for me to learn before I submit my papers to peer review. And then finally, and this is, I think, some of the most interesting things that we can learn, disagreement can also be evidence that your interlocutor has a different tolerance for risk 
epistemic or otherwise. That can be a very interesting conclusion to come to. Because what you can do then is you can start tracking the kind of risk portfolios that your colleagues have. And sometimes you want to go to someone who has a high tolerance for risk. Sometimes you want to go to someone who has a low tolerance for risk. How are you going to find out what their tolerance is? Disagreement can enable you to do that. So this is something important to us as good inquirers. Learn to interpret your higher order evidence properly. And I think this is as important in scientific inquiry as it is in political discussions and in everyday discussions as well. Thank you very much.